I'm Priscilla Candell, here to share my love of the arts with you. For years, I've taught piano, sung at theme parks and special events, composed music for children, and produced and performed in live shows, television, and films. On this show, I'll be sharing various artists and types of art. Welcome to The Arts and You. Hi, on today's show, you're going to meet a prominent producer of the 60s to the 90s. He's worked with all the major studios and networks and with legendary actors, Sean Connery, Natalie Wood, Rock Hudson, Barbara Streisand, Jerry Lewis, and many more. Here to tell his inside yeah. stories is Arnold Orgolini. Thank you. Sure, I look forward to being, look forward to talking to you about it. Well, you're called a producer. Then we hear the word executive producer. Can you tell us the differences and what you did? Well, I, there's very little difference between a producer and executive producer. And when I first started, there was only a producer. There was never an executive producer. Um, executive producer can be somebody who brings the money in, somebody who is related to somebody else that has the power to give them the, the credit. It's never really quite clear. Um, a, a producer, when I first started in the business, and it is very different today, let me preface it by saying that. When I first started in the business, the producer, the most important thing he could do is find a good piece of material, a good script. If you have a good script, then you really have something. You can attract the talent, you can attract the uh, directors, you can attract the money, you can attract the distribution. If you have a bad script, you're gonna struggle the whole time through. You're never really gonna make it work for yourself. So a good script is the first most important thing. And the producer basically is the boss. He's in charge of, he makes all the, the final decisions are all his, though you have to leave, let the director you have to give him a lot of leeway, make sure that, but make sure he has everything he needs to make the best movie possible. That's really what's the important thing is, is to grease the way for everybody, to make sure everything is okay. And that's what you did. And that's what I did. Now tell me about yeah. the executive producer. Is that just <clears throat> the money person? In, in some cases it's a money person, in some cases it's somebody who, it's, it could be an agent who wants an executive producer credit because they brought in some talent that they said if you if you if if you want this talent i want an executive producer credit so sometimes you you agree to it and that's what they that's why their credit is there when i first started in the business there was always one producer one director one writer today you can get as many as 20 producers and 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 so many of them had nothing to do with the show at all really and absolutely nothing to do with the show it's how they got the picture made, oh my. you know, and it's um, it's unfortunate because the, the 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 academy should really kind of put their foot down on that. I worked with producers, uh, Daryl uh, um, <clears throat> Richard Zanuck, who made the sh so many wonderful good movies, said to me at one time uh, that the idea of having more than one producer on the show is really bad because uh, it it. You, you never, or you're never really clear on who's the boss. Wow! You know, and you really need that. You, you need a clarification. Now so. I really want to know next mm -hmm. how you got into the film business. <clears throat> did you just start out as a film critic, or a lover, or a fan, or what? What did you do? No, you know, I started out on the financial side. I was, I, I was, um, I graduated with a degree in accounting. I was doing an audit with Price Waterhouse of Warner Brothers and. The second day I was there, I remember I was just in, enamored with being on a studio lot. And I said, uh, is there any chance, I talked to one of the police there, and I said, is there any chance you could maybe guide me into where I could go watch some shoot? And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, I'll go down to stage seven, go down there about 6.30. They're shooting all night tonight. It's a big water set. And they're shooting the old man of the sea. Wow. Which was a book I read in college and it was one of my favorite books and and he said, Go down there, you you'll enjoy it. So I went down there and surprise, surprise. Spencer Tracy, who played the leading role in it. My. And Ernest Hemingway was there watching them shoot. And I went up to the top of the loft and I looked down below on the and I thought to myself, 
This is the business you want to be in. That's an I, epic experience. I love that. I mean, I just love the business. Anyway, make a long story short, I, I did a little more on the audit in, uh, for about another two months. And uh, Well, what I, about I, the set? Were they uh, doing the water scene when you were there? Yes. Was it a pool? It's a huge set, w which was designed to, to have at least four feet of water in it. And four? Would, and that's all? Yeah, that's all you needed, you know. And, and then they would float everything accordingly as they needed it. And it was very complicated at that time. Remember, this was the 60s. It was very, very complicated. And, but they did it, and they did a wonderful job of it. And you never, if you go see the movie today, you'll see. You'll, you'll never know that you're yeah. sitting in, you're no, not because sitting, the first scenes the were done on a beach. Yeah, yeah. And what about the waves <clears throat> and the water? Did they have well, the big they, fans yeah, sure, going? They have, they have a large, very large... Um, apparatus that moves it so it does, it's not so much waves as it gives movement to the ocean and that's all you need when you actually wanted the waves they would cut away from that and they would and then they had a lot of stock footage for for that oh what a fantastic experience yeah. and to see Ernest Hemingway yeah. that's amazing now what about your first film well I you know I, I after I've Worked at Warner Brothers for a while. I had an opportunity to do an independent show, which I did in Canada, <clears throat> called The Beginners with Jacqueline Bissett and, and Leslie Caron. And Leslie Caron was replaced by Jacqueline Bissett. And, Why? Um, th there was some kind. Of, there was a problem going on, and the problem was basically the director, the director who they had sent up, and the reason the United Artists sent me up there was there was going to be some problems, and they were concerned about it. And they said, just kind of keep your eye on it. To, watch what's going on here because we have a problem with with the director but they hired him and he was ready to go so we went up um there was problems with leslie Caron. she decided she didn't want to do it so we had to very quickly hire somebody new and this was Le jacqueline Bissett was i think it was her second movie wow terrific woman to work with just terrific just beautiful wonderful woman to work with so we did the picture, and, I, and it was a great experience for me because I was exposed to all the problems. The, the director was fired, the production manager was fired, the star was left the show. You know, those are a lot of problems in, in the midst of preparing a movie. That was a lot of problems. And, and you had to stay on budget with all of this. And United Artists was constantly in your sandbox saying, you know, you, you've got to do, you, why are we getting out of, what's happening here? Well, how's this going to get solved? It, it eventually all got solved. The movie got made and got released, and it got re released nicely, and it did stay on budget, but it was complicated. What was so the budget going for It was $900,000. How much? 900000 I think equivalent today about $5 million. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But $900,000 is, you know. Well, uh, these are interesting yeah. stories, and <clears throat> we have many more to share with you. Right now, we're going to take a little break, and when we come back, we're going to hear more about Arnold's movies. It's a hip hop alphabet from A to Z. Hi, I'm Priscilla Candell, singer songwriter of many children's songs. Give your children a head start in learning through music with my interactive songs about ABCs, numbers, bugs, birds, animals, international words, and foods, as well as life. Sing, dance, and draw with songs that develop talents and brains. So now tell me about Barbara Streisand. What did you do with her? I did a movie called Up the Sandbox. It came from a, <clears throat> a play on Broadway and a, and a, a book. Um, and she loved it. It was for her company called First Artist. It was, first Artist was with Paul Newman, uh, Steve McQueen, and her formed this company. It was like United Artists, and it was like what they had done many years ago to avoid working with the studios, and they got an enormous amount of financing. So anyway, it was her project, and uh, I was hired to, to watch the money and to where did they film uh, that? We, sh we shot it in Los Angeles, we shot in New York, we shot in London, but the best part was in Kenya, in Africa, ah. in East Africa. Um, we worked, I remember, I can give you a little story about 
Barbara Streisand, who was really wonderful to work with, very professional, very good at what she did. <coughs> and we were running a little behind schedule. And I remember I got a call from First Artists and said, we have a conversation with her and maybe we can find out why we can move a little quicker. And I knew why we were moving slowly because the cameraman would light the set and take a long time to light the set. And by the time he finished, you could shoot anywhere you wanted in that set. You never had to relight it. That's mm -hmm. how, that's how that's really a good advantage. he was. He was really, really good. Uh, so we still had to have the conversation with Barbara. So the production manager and myself said, went, went to her trailer and said, can we talk to you for a few? And she said, sure. Anyway, so, so uh, we went in and we said, listen, we're having some problems that we're getting behind budget and it's scenes are taking too long. And, and, you know, we're talking and she's listening very politely. And then she finally said, well, wait a minute, hold on a minute. She said, listen, let me tell you something, first of all. This is my company. My and she was saying it nicely to us. But she said, when my face is on that camera and on that screen, I don't care how long it takes. We said, oh, okay. And we disappeared. We left the room. Never, never brought it up again. Budget did. The picture did come in on budget, but she was very, very specific about what she wanted and how she wanted to see herself. She and, was a perfectionist. And she was a professional, and you know the history proves that she's always correct. She really was. She was terrific to work with too. How about some personal stories? What you did in Africa? Um, well, there's one I can tell you about. But about Barbara again is. We, uh, we were not too far from Nairobi, so on the weekends we would all trek into Bar Nairobi and, you know, go to the little bazaars that they had there and we would, you know, everybody would buy something. And I remember Barbara, because she, she didn't have any currency, that the currency was, uh, was a Kenyan currency, so I gave her some dollars to work with and she said she went to buy a carpet, small carpet, beautiful carpet. They make really beautiful work. And she and and I I couldn't help but watching her. She was it was a, I think it was about thirty dollars in U.S. dollars, and she was trying to negotiate it down to twenty. <laughs> now this is an extremely wealthy woman, but it's you know the the Brooklyn came out in her. I mean she just she said I had to do it, Arnold. I just I had I can't just buy anything retail. And it was it was terrific. She was a terrific lady to work with. It was a great experience, and 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 I wish it would have been a better movie, but it was that's okay. You know, oh, they're my not goodness. all good. This but. is a fantastic story. Okay, we're going to take a little break now. Don't go away because we have many more stories with Arnold. See you in a bit. Stay tuned. There's more coming on the arts and you. I love to play with music. I love to sing a song. Hi, I'm Priscilla Candell, and I've been a voice teacher for years. Do you like to sing and wish you had better tone and diction? How about holding the notes longer or making those high notes feel easier? I've made a CD of basic vocal exercises as used in my private lessons. Now they can help you anywhere you go. Back. I'm here with Arnold Orgolini, film producer, and I know you worked with Jerry Lewis. Everybody loved Jerry Lewis. Tell us about him and what you did with him. Well, it's inter interesting you say that because Jerry Lewis, when I was just starting in the business, I used to, I loved his movies. I loved he, when he did the Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis movies together. They were My wonderful. favorite. Dissolve. Many years later, I get a call from United Artists saying, listen, Arnold, can you help us? We're we're trying to get the financing together for <clears throat> a movie for Jerry Lewis. It's called Cracking Up, which subsequently became Smorgasbord when it was released foreign in the United States. It was called Cracking Up. They used two different titles. Cracking Up didn't make any sense in Europe, but here it made sense. Makes sense. <clears throat> so they said, take a look at the script and see what you think, and then go meet with him. So I, I read the script and went over and met with him and I met with him at the <clears throat> Century Plaza Hotel in the in the presidential suite. I've never been in a presidential suite before, but there I was in the president. He was preparing for his for his um, charity 
event that he always had every year for the children. Yes, for, for, um, we love that, the yeah, muscular and, dystrophy. Yeah, right, and it was, it was wonderful. Anyway, so I went up there and I, I remember walking into these huge doors, which were <clears throat> the presidential doors, and there and there was, it was like a scene from a, a movie. There was people running around, all kinds of work going on, and in the center of this, way over in the corner, was Jerry Lewis. Just working and busy, 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 big. And one thing I noticed immediately was a big jar of, of jelly beans, because jelly beans, really? he's constantly eating jelly beans, he loves sweets. Cameras, cameras, television on in every area. Televisions everywhere, different channels. Going. He had so much going on. It was, whew, boy, I can. So he says, hey, oh, you're the guy, Arnold, come on over here and tell, 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 tell me. So tell me about the script. You know, you want me to take a look at the script? So we started to talk, and that was my first introduction to him. This is a guy that has such a history with so many <clears throat> major people and, and, and is way beyond just an actor. He was really a lot more. There's a real depth to this. Was he always on? He was like on constantly. He was constantly on, but gentle and nice and easy to work with and funny and v considerate of everybody else. It was, r it was wonderful work. And so I showed him... I said, yes, I read the script. I think it's kind of got some real potential in here. We'd like to make some changes. So he said, fine. We started to talk. And then we make a long story short. We eventually put it together. We shot it all in Los Angeles. And he was wonderful, wonderful to work with. I mean, he would get there at 5 o'clock in the morning. He Ooh. would get there before anybody else would. And he was ready for the day. He made sure when we shot on locations on the streets that there was some benches and things so if people that wanted to just walking around just happened to be the pedestrian, they could sit there and watch. My he goodness. was really considerate about everybody else. He, won. he was on stage all the time. So himself. he loved that live uh, audience, people. He really did. Very talented. <clears throat> he introduced me to what is the micro, what is today the playback. He was the first one to ever use it, where he would shoot um, a scene, and then he could look at it immediately on a playback. And that didn't exist then. And I said, you know, I remember when he first did that, I said, well, what is that? He said, that's a playback. Let me show you how it works. You <clears throat> had a lot of people in that movie besides Jerry Lewis. Who were they? Uh, we had Milton Berle, uh, who was a very close friend of Jerry Lewis's, and so it was easy to get him. It was a very small part, but he was just happy to do it. He came, worked a few hours, and then left. Then there was Sammy Davis Jr., again, a very close friend of Jerry's, and, and did a small part. Um, Zane Busby. Uh, and, and, you know, he was able to attract a lot of his old friends, big names, just to get him on there. What we really wanted to get was Dean Martin, but that didn't oh, work. They had Needless a feud. To say. No, there was. They did. They had. A, they. They really didn't talk after the. Yeah. After that wonderful. You had a football player on there too. <clears throat> we did. Mike Ditka. Yeah, from, from the Chicago Bears, who did this wonderful part, where he plays a psychiatrist, and and he questions Jerry Lewis, and 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 he explodes at the end. You know, psychiatrists don't explode. Psychiatrists <laughs> listen calmly. My Ditka exploded. It was a funny, funny scene. Anyway, Fantastic. Yes. Well, I know you have done so many more movies, but one of the big ones was called Embryo, because there you had Rock Hudson playing a doctor who did some experiments with serums on a tiny dog that grew very rapidly, and he trained him. So he decided to use that serum on a human being who was played by Barbara Carrera, she turns into a beautiful woman, and he trains her, and also makes her very intelligent. And then I saw Roddy McDowell does a little part there where he's playing chess with her, isn't impressed how smart she is. But of course, as all experiments go, something goes wrong, and she wanted more of that serum, but it had to come from new embryos, which was a problem. And she turns eventually into a very old, wrinkled woman. But now, I want to hear the inside stories. Well, getting Rock Hudson was the key to making the project work. Somebody brought me the screenplay. 
uh, the writer wrote me the screenplay, as a matter of fact. And, and uh, after I read it, I thought, well, this is an interesting story. It's not something that the studios would make. We'd probably have to raise the money independently. Uh, so we did some artwork in the beginning just to give the, in, the potential investors an idea what it's going to look like because the, the story itself can't be told that easily. So we did, and they liked it, and they said, fine, we're interested in getting involved in it. We, want it. we need to see a budget. We need to see who the cast is. We need to see who the director is. So that was my job to try and, who, and put that together. And uh, Who did so you get to direct it? We got Ra Ralph Nelson, <clears throat> very famous director, um, towards the end of his career. Uh, really liked the script, had a lot of good ideas and some changes. But we needed a, a, a star. And uh, uh, I forget how it came to me, but somebody brought me the idea of Rock Hudson. And it wasn't, wouldn't have been my first choice by any means, but when they, when they suggested Rock Hudson, I thought, well, this is a good idea. Interesting. Let's talk to him. So we sent him the script. He liked the script. He came in. We had a, <clears throat> I'll never forget, we had a meeting on a, in a restaurant on Sunset Boulevard. And my office was right down the street at the old Playboy building. And I, I remember when we walked in, you, you could have heard, I would have never thought this was going to happen, but you could have heard a pin drop in this very, very big, uh, noisy restaurant. It was so quiet. When because they, Rock Hudson you know, because was there? Rock Hudson, yeah. And, you know, we sat down, and the writer and I and he, and we, we, we chatted, and I, and I told them specifically, because a lot of people in Hollywood there said, please, no phone call. If, I get, if a phone call comes in, don't, because they, at that time, you, there was no cell phone, that they, they would bring you the phone, you know, this big clunky thing, and you'd have to sit there and have a phone call. Well, of course, one of the waiters didn't pay any attention, and they bring us the phone in the, mid, in the middle of this thing, and... You know, Rock Hudson was saying, oh, I see, since I'm, I'm back in Hollywood again, aren't How I? How nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you had we, Diane Ladd in that film as well, but I want to hear more what it was like on a set with Rock Hudson. He was terrific to work with. He was always prepared, <clears throat> always ready. You know, as a man, must have had 30 movies behind him, 30 or 40 movies behind him, though they were different, obviously totally different movies. He never did this kind of movie. The only kind of romantic movie he did before was, of course, famous movie was called The Giant, you know, with, with Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, and I remember talking to him about it once. He said it was, it was wonderful working with her. He said, I hated James Dean. And he said, uh, I hated being in the middle of the desert like that. He said, but other than that, he said, Elizabeth Taylor made the difference. He said, we became very good friends and stayed friends. He said, we're still friends today. Well, how did it work with him being gay on the set? It was, it was uh, complicated because there were a couple of love scenes. The director didn't really know how to do it. Uh, um, not that he didn't know how to do it. He didn't, he, he didn't know how to be comfortable doing it because there was some passionate kissing going on in there. There was no... There weren't love scenes like you see today, but there was some real passionate kissing. So you had to have two or three cameras to cover it. I forget. I think it was two cameras to cover it so that, you know, when the lips are about to meet, <laughs> you had to cut it to another <laughs> angle. And, you you know, so it, it was complicated and it was um, uncomfortable for both he and Barbara. Barbara knew he was gay and tried to, you know, co cooperate as much as possible to make it work. And and he was hesitant, you know. You went to his house. What was that like? A magnificent home up in the Benedict Canyon. <clears throat> and I remember we used to, Barbara and I would go up and watch the dailies together because he wanted to see the dailies there. He didn't want to go into the studio and see, he wanted to see. So we took him up as a, as a convenience for him. And I remember sitting in the back and Barbara kept telling me, she told me two or three times, she said, oh, it's really difficult. I hope these scenes, these, these kissing scenes really work. And as it turned out, they did work. They, they were able to cut it together and enough loud music and, you know. What about his other guests who would be there <clears> in the house? Well, you know, it, you know he was a gay man and, and his world was all male. And, and there, was, there, were no, there were never any females there to Barbara. And, and I think I was the only non-gay man there. And 
you know, uh, these are all lovely guys. They're beautiful young men all running around working. You know, they worked for him. They took care of his house. They did, you know, they did his laundry. They, you know, it was, it was a different lifestyle, but it was his lifestyle. And, what a wonderful actor, though. Oh, yeah. And he didn't bother him, but he just, he was, everybody liked him. I mean, we did a couple of interviews, I remember, with Doris Day that we were going to do and then and to, to kind of promote the movie. And she had nothing but wonderful things to say about him. Right. And of course, Elizabeth Taylor did, too. They, they just loved him. Everybody. And he was a terrific guy to work with. He yes. was a really nice man. He just, he had a proclivity that we didn't, that's all. Arnold, you have such wonderful stories to tell. We're going to have you back on our next show to hear more about what you can share in your all your films. So you be sure to come back and join us again with Arnold and I on the arts and you.